Welcome to the Belated Tech Channel, the home for retro tech, innovation, science, and technological entertainment. If you were born after 1970, it is likely you are completely unaware that handheld electronic computing devices were not available before 1972. All types of handheld electronic devices, iPhones, Galaxies, PDAs, MP3 players, Nintendo Switches, just to name a few, are descended in some fashion from Hewlett Packard's revolutionary HP 35 scientific calculator released in that year. We reviewed the HP 35 and the history of electronic calculators in episode 3. You can find a link to episode 3 below. Electronic computing devices, calculators for lack of a better term, between 1961 and 1972 were as big as cash registers, and before 1961 there weren't any calculators smaller than a refrigerator. The first all-electronic computer, the U.S. Army's ENIAC, went into service in 1945, and the first electromechanical computer, the U.S. Navy's Torpedo Data Computer, went into service in 1938. So, if you were the father of modern rocketry, Robert Goddard, what did you use in 1932 to compute the answer to complicated ballistic and chemical propellant problems? The most obvious likelihood is a slide rule. Slide rules have been around for centuries and would continue to be in common use for another half century more. They were ideal for computing logarithms and trigonometric values, among other complex mathematic concepts. If you needed to know quickly, however, what the answer to 656 joules times 781 kilograms was without resorting to pencil and paper, you could often use a slide rule to figure that out too. But the problem with the slide rule is that you just couldn't retrieve it from a pocket as most are about a foot long. You had to run back to your desk and get it. Or you could just pull out your VPO ad from your shirt pocket. What's a VPO ad? This American device, adapted from Europe, became one of the most used pocket-sized computing conveniences for the period between World War I and the Vietnam War. Let's find out what was the VPO ad, its origins, and its relevance to modern computing today. Fifty-three thousand Americans died in World War I, known then as the Great War, but the war brought on an economic boom that launched the Roaring Twenties. Technological advancements were being made in almost every facet of U.S. society, and no more so than in the business community, which hummed and clattered with an ever-increasing quantity of machines to make commerce more productive. In 1924, James Arthur Lyons of Chicago, Illinois, a business machine distributor, was looking for a way to tap into the thriving mechanical calculator market then dominated by Burroughs. A Burroughs adding machine could cost more than a Ford Model T and was about the size and weight of a mechanical typewriter, or about 40 pounds. Business was booming, so Burroughs couldn't sell enough of the expensive monstrosities. Lyons figured there was an underserved market for a much cheaper device, and he set about looking for likely candidates. Mechanical calculators of all sizes have been sold for centuries, but most were handcrafted and expensive. That all changed in 1889 when Frenchman Louis Tronce patented an inexpensive design for a handheld mechanical calculator. The calculator entered manufacturing in the 1890s, and once Tronce's patents expired in years following, other manufacturers made their own versions. The Adiator of 1920 by Berlin-based Adiator Gesellschaft became the most ubiquitous variant and all types have been produced in the hundreds of thousands in the 30 years since Tronce finalized his design. Lyons managed to get his hands on one of the Tronce devices and set out to find a manufacturer that could fabricate his own version. The deal he struck with the manufacturer he eventually found was exclusive and lucrative. He retained naming rights to the device, which he called a VPO ad, short for Vest Pocket Adding Machine, and printed materials claiming that his business which he marketed at various times as either Lyons Associates or the Reliable Typewriter and Adding Machine Company, actually manufactured the devices. His price for the VPO ad was $2.95, significantly cheaper than the cheapest $100 Burroughs machine, but still a tidy sum in 1924. His cost was likely less than a dollar a device. Who the actual manufacturer was, and whether the devices were imported from Europe or produced domestically, seems to be lost to time. 
It was likely that Lyons used multiple manufacturers to hold down production costs, as the competition for entry-level mechanical calculators was cutthroat. The little devices proved to be popular, and their use only ended when electronic alternatives began to surface in the 1960s. The Vipo ad was anything but a toy. Lyons' devices were simple, but well-made, and Tronce's ingenious design made sure that the Vipo ad's calculations were accurate. The calculator had a faintly Art Deco flair, and in 1924, the Vipo ad must have seemed quite the wonder. The Vipo ad was sold in a simple folded and glued cardboard box printed in a single color ink. Full color packaging was available throughout between 1924 and 1960, but cost was a consideration at the retail price of $2.95. To the right of the Vipo ad is an HP 35 calculator for size comparison. The HP 35 was specifically designed to fit in a shirt or jacket pocket, so you can see that a Vipo ad was similarly adept. For a modern comparison, an HP 35 is a little smaller than the iPhone XR from 2019. The Vipo ad comes glued into a sort of wallet, which can be flipped open like a small notebook. The calculator is formed from a thin sheet metal into a flat case with the brass mechanicals inside. Operation of the calculator is fairly simple. It comes with a stylus, perhaps one of the first uses of a stylus for a handheld computing device that is used to select the desired number by inserting the stylus into a slot and moving the display to the correct figure. What computations occur, subtraction, addition, multiplication, and division, depends on the order the figures entered and in what manner they are entered. We will not demonstrate operating the Vipo ad through a sample calculation, which has been done by better YouTubers than us. A link to one such video can be found below. Our unit came with its original instructions, which you are free to screen capture in case no instructions came with the Vipo ad in your collection, if you are lucky enough to own one. The Vipo ad is reset by extending a tab at the top of the case and pushing it back again. That's it. The calculator is ready for its next use. The calculator can be stood on end by using the top of the wallet as a support. And best of all, the Vipo ad doesn't need batteries. HP 35s and every electronic calculator that came after it most assuredly does. The success of the Vipo ad was a pleasant validation to Lyons, who had to go out on a limb and buy the calculators in high volumes to keep the unit costs low. The businessman had priced the product at a level he felt would be attractive to individual professionals that would not necessarily have personal access to an expensive adding machine. At $2.95, which is about $45 in 2020 money, the Vipo ad sold by the thousands. Lyons knew early on that his mail order model wasn't going to sell the quantities he needed without some help. So he aggressively solicited agents who would buy the product from him for resale who in turn recruited more agents. The Vipo ad cost Lyons less than a dollar each to manufacture and package, which gave him another $2 in gross margin to book a reasonable profit and allow agents to make money. The Vipo ad was a money maker, but it didn't make Lyons rich in spite of the hundreds of thousands that were eventually sold. The reliable typewriter and adding machine company remained as a small business machine distributor local to the Chicago market. It had this famous and quirky product, but often this brought headaches rather than rewards. In 1937, complaints from adding machine manufacturers such as Burroughs and Monroe about the marketing tactics of Lyons and his company concerning the Vipo ad brought legal consequences. The Federal Trade Commission charged reliable typewriter with deceptive advertising practices and demanded remedies. The FTC's case did not accuse Reliable Typewriter of selling a defective product, as the Vipo ad was an accurate calculator. Rather, the Commission's accusations hinged on the habit of Lyons of comparing the Vipo ad to an expensive adding machine, although there was little in common between the two types other than that both could add. The Commission also alleged that the company was dishonest with its own agents concerning its wholesale pricing, which apparently was not consistent. And finally, the Commission objected to Reliable Typewriter representing itself as the manufacturer of the Vipo ad, which admittedly it outsourced. Lyons hired a prominent Chicago law firm, Wetton, Pegler & Dale, and tried to argue that the Vipo ad marketing was not intended to show that the calculator could replace a Burroughs machine, but rather 
It was a more practical substitute when the features of such an expensive machine were not needed. Furthermore, Lyons admitted that he did not directly manufacture the Vipo ad, but since he contracted for its manufacture, that it was much the same thing. And finally, Lyons protested that his wholesale pricing, which was never specifically mentioned in advertising, was his company's prerogative and should not be forced to offer the same wholesale price to everybody regardless of circumstances. The FTC was unmoved by these arguments and issued a cease and desist order on all three counts. Fortunately, the Vipo ad had already sold in large quantities, lessening the need for the same aggressive advertising tactics. By all available evidence, Reliable Typewriter complied with the FTC order, and the company and the product never appeared again on the national stage. World War II brought further challenges to Lyons, as he could no longer get the Vipo ad manufactured in a wartime environment, but the Reliable Typewriter and Adding Machine Company still soldiered on, serving the Chicago area as a general business machine distributor. Technological advancements during the war caused an explosion in electromechanical and electric business machinery after the war ended, so the late 1940s, the 1950s, and the early 1960s featured diminishing sales of clever gigaws like the Vipo ad and even the stalwart mechanical typewriters and adding machines that Reliable Typewriter featured in its catalogs. The post-war boom also brought a number of business machine distribution competitors to the market, further squeezing Lyons' company. One such post-war business machines competitor, Commodore International, was covered in Episode 1. The link to Episode 1 can be found below. Finally, in 1965, the reliable typewriter and adding machine company agreed to be bought out by another Chicago business machine distributor, the International Typewriter Exchange. The Vipo ad had not been in production at the date of the acquisition, and ITE never revived it. ITE became ITE Distributing in the 1990s, and the company still exists today in Chicago, with its headquarters in the building named for its founder, William F. Clausing. ITE Distributing still sells typewriters, as well as electronic whiteboards and printers, but no adding machines. So, did Robert Goddard actually use a Vipo ad while designing his rockets? We'll never really know, but since the Vipo ad, other Tronce devices, and competing handheld mechanical calculators were sold in the millions during his tenure, it seems likely that either the master himself or someone on his technical team used one. What do you think of the Vipo ad and its place in computing history? Is it just an American imposter of a European product? Or does it deserve a place next to the legendary HP 35? Share with us by dropping a comment below. We hope you enjoyed this look back at mechanical calculators and the Vipo ad. If so, click that like button. Clicking the subscribe button and the bell notification icon will also help you stay informed when new episodes are released. Links to previous computing related episodes and our other content can be found below. Stay connected by occasionally checking our Instagram feed, where we post content from our upcoming episodes and from episodes past that you may have missed. Make sure you follow our Twitter account, where all new episodes are announced. And finally, join us on our Facebook page, where we cover current news and events related to channel content. Thanks for watching.